Hey you guys and gals, Effie here. Today we are going to be talking about All Hail the Carrying King by Thomas Godfrey. Uh, it is, if I had to put it into terms that people would recognize or be familiar with, it's almost like if Terry Pratchett's Discworld had a baby with Stephen King's Dark Tower in the very best way. If you like book related content and you want to see more book reviews from me or find out about my fantasy series, The Tales of Tyrannoch, um, hit the subscribe button. It really does help me out, especially being a small creator. Every time somebody likes a video or comments on a video, it does a tremendous amount of work for me. So thank you so much for taking the time to do that. In the vein of full disclosure, the author did send me a copy of this book uh, for free in exchange for my honest review. He has not compensated me in any way, and all of the opinions expressed in this book are my own. Um, but because I received the book for free and it cost me nothing, I will be giving away a copy of it, which I tend to do with books that I really enjoy. Um, so yeah, if you want to sign up to receive a copy of this book after the review, pop on over to effiewritesbooks.com and make sure that you sign up for the mailing list. I'll be giving the book away um, in two weeks. Okay, so let's talk about the premise of the book, and I will be as spoiler-free as I possibly can. Everything that I'll be discussing in this video are things that um, are either overarching themes or things that you learn really early on, so it's not going to spoil the story for you. We start by following the last true jester of the West, and this character doesn't really have a name. Um, he sort of climbs out of a river with a knife in his back uh, in front of a bunch of fishermen who think that he's dead, um, and we later discover that he probably was, um, <laughs> and, and that he's not really human, right? Like, this is something we learned early on. We know he's not human, but we don't really know what he is. Um, you sort of, of learn a little more about him later, but the author leaves it kind of vague. Um, we will call him a tool of fate. Uh, and all throughout the book, from the beginning to the end, they're sort of talking about fate and being pulled by fate on strings like a puppet. Um, that was a, that was a prevailing theme in the book. No spoilers here. It, it's a massive part of the book's plot. The last true jester of the West has a human companion, which he meets in the first town um, after he exits the river. And the human is also a jester, which I took to be sort of the um, stars of their world, right? So like we have movie stars and movie starlets and they're famous. To, in this world, jesters are the movie stars, right? Um, jesters are the people who are famous. So this kid is a jester and he wants to be famous and he has this sort of like edgy humor. And we learn very quickly that this world is, it exists after a war between angels and humans and humans lost. So it's overseen by this sort of gruesome, bloody god called the Carrion King and a league of angels, blind angels, that are sort of these like grim, greasy remnants of what angels once were um, because they follow this bloody god. Um, and they sort of oversee the world and enforce his will very violently. Um, there are these blind knights. Um, that are sort of fanatical, zealotous followers of the Carrion King. And you and you start to sort of get this feeling that in order to follow the Carrion King, you must be blind. Um, and you learn eventually that they've plucked their own eyes out. Um, I say eventually, you learn, you learn pretty quickly, like in order to follow the Carrion King and be one of his most devoted followers, you have to take out your own eyes. Um, which is pivotal to the story but also really gruesome and the way that the author describes like the remaining viscera and like the the empty sockets and how like things within the sockets sort of move it's really gruesome and, <laughs> and i loved it <laughs> i kind of like things like that but if you're like really sensitive to gore you might not be into this book <laughs> okay so the premise of the book is the last true gesture of the West um, has come out of the water in the East and then is traveling to the West and he's going to the court of the Carrion King. And uh, this kid who also wants to be a famous gesture is going with him. He takes the kid with him um, and, and they're both going to see the Carrion King. And you get the impression that the jester is going to confront him and the kid wants to go perform for him so that he can become famous. So that's the premise of the book. 
Uh, one of the really interesting ways that the author conveys the state of the world and how the world is sort of in transition after this war is that in the East, where we start, everything is sort of like typical medieval peasantry. You know, there's there's thatch roof huts and everything sort of like um, ox-drawn carts and, you know, we, we do our, our farming by hand. And then the further West they go, the more technologically advanced things become. So the cities in the West have towering skyscrapers made of metal and glass, and they have like uh, horse-drawn carriages, but the the horses are robots, and and they have trains and big screens on the walls that are, you know, displaying these beautiful images and kind of like either advertising or like a, a almost like a, like a TV show or a newscast or something. Um, so the, the disparity between the East and the West and as the technology, you know, as the Caring King's influence increases, the technology is slowly creeping eastward. Um, I thought that that was really great and, and I thought that the author did a really good job at um, portraying the difference between the people who were completely enthralled to the Carrying King um, being this very technologically advanced, but also very blind society. And then the people in the East being more primitive, but also more free, um, more free thinking, more free speaking, um, often to their own detriment. And it's punished very harshly because of these angels. But um, I thought that it, I thought that the contrast was really well done and sort of um, the Carrying King's influence creeping eastward and, and, and you know, you know, all of these benefits come around, but there's a lot of downsides too. Um, so I thought that that was great. Um, another thing that was interesting in the book and the way that it was approached was there is no internal dialogue. Uh, we have these two characters and we don't see what they think or what they feel. What we get is their their way that they speak to each other and to other people in, in the environment. Um, the way that they interact with the environment at large, the way that they move through scenes is very descriptive. Um, but we don't really get that sort of internal monologue that a lot of books have. So you are left to make your conclusions about the characters on your own. The author does not tell you who these people are, what their motivations are, what they're feeling, what they're thinking. Like that is not allowed to influence your perception of the characters. So the judgments you make about them are based solely on what they do and what they say. And it really worked. Like, I don't know how to explain why that got me so much more invested, but knowing that I was making the decision on whether or not I liked the character or whether or not I agreed with the choices that they were making in that moment, um, it really helped me get invested in them and really helped me get invested in the next step. Not so much in them as people, but in what they were doing and the choices that they were making. Um, I found that I was really rooting for certain outcomes um, and was either elated or deflated based on whether or not the character um, complied with my wishes for them. And I think that that was, I think that that was largely in part due to the fact that I didn't know what they were thinking, I only knew what they were doing. And so I became very invested in the actions that they were taking. So um, it was really well executed on the part of the author. Anybody who's been around for a while knows that I like contrast. Um, this is a gruesome, grim, dark, gritty world. And the jester who is the main character or one of the two main characters is sort of this like brightly colored flouncy you know he's got bells on his jester hat um he sort of prances around he's very sing-songy in the way that he talks and the juxtaposition between those two things um was brilliant it, it was really well done it's n not everybody can pull that off um sandman for example which i was so excited for attempted it and in my opinion, didn't do a great job. Um, the book does such a good job at relaying the contrast between this bright, jangly, prancy, flouncy sort of gesture and the, the gritty gray world that he resides in. Um, and, and the juxtaposition worked really well. It sort of helped you understand that he was the last remaining bastion of whatever he was um, and that it was fading. Um, and, and I thought that it was done expertly. I thought it was done really well. Another thing that I think that the author did really well was uh, introducing the concept of a multiverse. I am not a multiverse fan. Um, in fact, I actively dislike the multiverse concept. 
Um, in general, I find that it is a very lazy way to sort of fix problems or uh, unwrite consequences. Um, I find very often that authors use multiverses to sort of pop back and forth between worlds and, um, you know, you put your character in this, these terrible stakes and they fail and then you just erase all of the consequences by just shifting dimensions and going somewhere where they actually succeeded. And I think that that's really cheap um, and it always ruins a story for me. That does not happen in this book. Um, you, he introduces the concept of a multiverse. It is used as a tool to help you understand the scope, the cosmic scope of the actions that the characters are taking, but it's not done in a way that's cheap. It is not done in a way that fixes all their problems. If anything, it actually adds to their problems. It's not overly complicated. It's not so deeply explained that it becomes ridiculous. Um, it's there. It's introduced enough and explained enough that it's very easy to grasp the concepts, but not so deep that it gets bogged down in the details. Um, he did a really good job with it. It's probably the only time I've actually been introduced to the concept of a multiverse that I haven't just instinctively gone, ew. Um, yeah, I, I think it was really well done. The, the multiverse in All Hail the Carrion King was fantastic. Um, and I kind of hope that he writes other books in this sort of universe that he's created. I, I don't know how he would, but it's, it's really great. <laughs> As much as I like this book, no book is perfect. So let's talk about a few things that I think could have been done a little better or would have served the book better. First things first, I don't feel like this cover art does this book any favors. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but it's very, it's very dark. It's, it's kind of muddy. Um, and if I saw this book on a shelf, I would not pick it up. This, this cover is not serving its purpose. That does not mean that it's bad art. Um, that does not mean that it is poorly rendered. I think that cover art serves a very specific purpose and I, and that's to sell books. And I don't think that this cover sells the book very well. Um, the image is of the Carrion King, so I understand why it was used or why it was chosen. Um, but I think that there were better options. I think, um, having sort of a misty background of like the glass city and then the jester prancing in front of it may have been better or something like that. Maybe with the, the dark angels or something like there, there was a better way, um, something with more contrast, something that helped you understand, um, more of the scope of the book. Like I get why the Carrying King was chosen because the book's literally called all hail the Carrying King, but like, it's not about him. The book is not about him. And, and I think he was not the subject that should have been chosen. And I think that the rendering is too dark to sell the book. Um, yeah, so that's my opinion. I don't, I don't think that the cover art serves the purpose it was meant to serve, which is to sell the book. Another thing was the fight scenes, right? Like, um, as someone who writes books, fight scenes are really, really difficult to write. Um, you need to convey enough information that the reader can follow along with what's going on, uh, but not so much information that it kind of gets bogged down in the details, right? Like you don't want like Bob swung his left arm and connected with Susan's jugular or whatever. Like, okay, now I'm going to get accused of misogyny. Um, anyway, you, you, you don't want to get into all the details, but you want to convey enough information that people understand what's happening. And I think that, um, there were certainly places within this book where we got kind of bogged down in the details of the fight, right? Um, so you don't need to describe every blow. And, and I don't feel like he did, but I feel like he still went too deep into detail, especially when there were fights with many, many moving parts. Um, you kind of get lost in the shuffle and they kind of carried on for longer than they needed to, to relay the information. So the important parts in the fight scenes, and they are necessary, the fight scenes are absolutely necessary. I'm not saying cut them, just condense them a little. So the important parts of the fight scene were the jester is unkillable um, because fate is pulling his strings. He moves like a marionette because fate is pulling his strings. Um, and uh, the, the counterbalance, the knights and the angels have no qualms about slaughter. They, they do not care about, uh, civilian casualties. They do not care if people get hurt. Um, they almost relish 
the gore of it. They almost relish the slaughter. Um, and that's really important. So if those three are the important parts, those three are what need to be conveyed. And they were, the problem was it kind of got bogged down with, you know, he swung his right arm, he flipped his dagger and threw it and, and that sort of thing. Um, you can have a little bit of that, but I think that there was a little too much. And therefore the fight scenes dragged a little bit and I kind of got lost. The final thing was there were a few places read two or three where the dialogue felt a little stilted or unnatural or awkward. Um, and, and it was clear enough in that moment that I remembered them by the end of the book. Um, so they stuck out. Uh, they were just, and like I said, it was only two or three places. It did not, um, re, uh, reduce my enjoyment of the book. And it was certainly not the uh, most common dialogue. Most of the dialogue flowed really naturally. It felt really good, like two people actually talking to each other. Um, but there were a few places where it needed to be smoothed out a little bit. And, you know, it, it it's going to happen, right? Dialogue's hard to write. So, um, so yeah, I just thought I'd mention them because they're definitely there. And if you're like a real stickler for like perfectly smooth dialogue, like you might run into a few sentences, like two or three in the whole book, um, that are not flawless. Um, but that, I mean, you know, it's, it's a nitpick. It's not really, like I said, it didn't re reduce my enjoyment of the book. It didn't detract from the story. Um, uh, but there's certainly a few places in there where the dialogue wasn't perfect. So, uh, in general, I found the story to be engaging. I found the, uh, world building and the lore and, and just the, the environment in general to be really interesting and engaging. I really liked the way that the author used character action to sort of pull you in and get you invested in what they were doing. Um, and overall, I, I really enjoyed the book. I highly recommend it. Again, I will be giving away a copy of All Hail Carrion King in two weeks if you are interested in receiving a copy of the book. Uh, the way that this works is if you live in the US, you will have the option of either receiving a paperback book like this um, or an ebook. If you live overseas in, in Europe or elsewhere, wherever you happen to live, um, you'll only be available to get an ebook because the shipping um, for, <laughs> for mailing physical copies is cost prohibitive for me. Um, it's really expensive to ship books overseas. I don't know why, um, but the last time I tried to mail something this size, it was like hundred dollars <laughs> and I'm not doing that. Like I love the book, but come on. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, uh, paperback or ebook for us or Canada or, um, ebook for people who live overseas. So if you're interested in that, sign up at effiewritesbooks.com. Um, join the newsletter giveaway thing. It's a big red button. You can't miss it. Thank you so much for watching. Again, All Hail the Carrying King by Thomas Godfrey. Really enjoyed it, and I hope that you do too. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. And of course, if you like the way that I present information, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell down below. You can find all of my social media contacts in the description. And of course, if you want to keep up with me and the progress I'm making on my current novel, you can do that at effiewritesbooks.com. Thank you so much for watching. Have an excellent day, and I'll see you next time.